Get to the church blind! Get to the church blind! Go! Now! I'm Pete Mitchell, and he's Peyton Jones, and you're listening to Hardcore Church Planning, the companion podcast to the Church Planner Podcast and Church Planner Magazine. Each week, we'll bring you interviews from planners who are in the trenches making it happen right now. These active church planners bear it all, share their successes, their failures, and what they'd wish they'd known when they were first starting out. Listen in to discover how God is working in their church plan. You know, when I have a large project at home, sometimes it makes sense to do it by myself. At other times, I actually save money in the long term and have a much better solution if I use an expert. It's really not that much different with church planning. Church planners who focus on building their core team and actually planting the church and partner with portability experts like Portable Church Industries hit the ground running. Yes, you may have to raise more funds up front, but let me tell you something. If I could go back in a time machine and do one thing different in all the churches that I planted, I would go back and have invested that money in Portable Church and all of the super cool kit that they give you to make the volunteers and their lives much, much easier. Trust me, your volunteers will feel invested in, and they're going to give you more of what they got. And that time where people are setting up is going to be a time where it sets the atmosphere for you to thrive. If you're thinking about launching in the next six to 36 months, we encourage you to check them out at portablechurch.com. Hey, Church Planner, this is Peyton Jones. Welcome to today's edition of Hardcore Church Planning. I have on here as my guest, uh, Dr. Chuck Lawless of chucklawless.com. He is the Dean of Doctoral Studies and the Vice President of Spiritual Formation at Southeastern. Welcome on to the show. Hey, thank you. Glad to be with you today. Can I call you Dr. Chuck? That's fine. Chuck right. works too, actually. Chuck, okay, so we don't got to say the doctor thing. Okay. All right. Yeah. I get it. So here's the deal. Um Wanted to talk to you today about uh, discipleship, but before we do that, the first question we always like to ask is, "How did you come to faith?" Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I love I love telling the story, Peyton. I was I was not raised in a Christian home. I was raised in Southwestern Ohio. My parents were not believers. It was actually a seventh grade classmate who shared the gospel with me, and I I describe him as a uh, completely obnoxious, rude, tactless, uh, almost unkind 12-year-old Pentecostal preacher, uh, because he he was in my face every day with the gospel, e- even to the extent that he would meet me in the classroom door when I walked in the door some mornings and say, Chuck, it's it's a good thing you live through the night, uh, be- because he would say you'd be in hell right now if you, if you uh, hadn't. And while he had no tact, he had a lot of truth, and he did not let up on me. Yeah. And I actually, I actually went to church with a neighbor in the summer between my seventh grade and eighth grade years because I wanted to go back to eighth grade and tell this kid, I went to church, get off my back, and God grabbed my heart that day a lot of years ago now. Wow. And that dude is surely praying. You know, it's, it's funny. My, uh, I, you know, I've been noticing a trend, and I'm sure you have as well. That, um, in fact, I got a, a a Facebook message today from somebody who said, "Hey, Peyton, been hearing a lot of conversation around evangelism and discipleship, and people are kind of talking about like, you know, they're kind of disparaging evangelism." And my response was, "That's because we don't do it, and it's a lot easier to kind of hide behind the fig leaf of disciple making." to Mm -hmm. expose our lack of inactivity. Because what I told him is, really, people don't do either, but it's a whole lot harder to fake evangelism, right, than disciple. Oh, it's all about disciple making. I give you almost a guarantee, and I know you're going to back me on this, but it's talk. It's a lot of talk. Hardly anyone who's talking about discipleship is actually doing it. And I know that because I interview a lot of people. And I'll ask him, well, who are you deciding? <laughs> and I'm not trying to embarrass my guests. Now, I have a feeling with you it's a little bit different. But um, my thought on evangelism is it's gone out of fashion. And I, it's kind of sad because we're letting this happen. And evangelism is very, very important. And it's no. just not in vogue. It's just not trendy right now. Yeah, no, no question. And we 
most of us have very few, if any, role models who who have shown us how to just enter a conversation, speak the good news of Jesus to somebody. So we haven't seen it fleshed out. We're we're told to do it, but we don't have anybody modeling it for us. And I think you're exactly right. I think particularly for young leaders, if I have a concern about their renewed interest in discipleship, it is that they are going to focus on discipleship to the exclusion of evangelism, which means it's not really even New Testament discipleship. Right, right. So unpack that a bit. New Testament discipleship is? It is It is the, the process by which we invest in one another's lives as God uses us to help each other uh, as he is conforming us to the image of his son. So we're walking side by side. I don't think that's the only way to do it. In fact, I think discipleship happens corporately. It happens in small groups. It happens in mentoring relationships with the goal of our being provoking each other to good works as God is conforming us to the image of Christ. Mm, That's good, man. So how did this kind of become a passion of yours? Well, I told you how I became a believer. I was I was 13 when that happened. I actually started pastoring full time when I was 20 years old. Uh, right or wrong, that's that's the way it worked Me out. Too. Welcome um, to the club, brother. How old are you, by yeah, the way? It's, uh, Can I ask that? Why, why that church put up with me? I have no idea. How, but how but old are you? I'm 56. Okay. All right. All right. So you've been in this game a little bit longer than me. I'm 44, but I started at 22. <laughs> yeah. 20, yeah, 20 was, also, uh, I should say. When when here's the, and here's the problem with that. In between those years, 13 and 20, while my church had a real brief membership class, and, and I had great, back then, it was Sunday school teachers who, who really did teach me every Sunday. Nobody, nobody really invested in me. And so as I, as I tried to be a teenage guy in a non-Christian home where, to be real honest, pornography was everywhere in our house, mm. I lived a whole lot of years in absolute defeat. And I don't want that to happen. I, I I had to fight the battles by myself. Right. And that's not the way the New Testament intends for us to, to grow together. Right. So out of my own failures, I I just feel a real deep burden. How do I help other young men walk faithfully with God? Mm, that's awesome. So, w- w- I mean, what was your first experience of discipleship? Was it you discipling someone else or someone finally coming and discipling you? Well, and, and to be fair, I had some youth ministers in our church who certainly challenged me to be to be obedient to my sense of calling, who gave me opportunities to to preach in a youth Sunday, for example, when I was 16. But it, but it really wasn't uh, until after I was pastoring that Somebody said, let me just walk with you and let's talk about what does it mean to be a pastor? What does it mean to be a man of God? Wow. That's huge. So, do you, do you so, want to yeah. give that person a shout out by any chance? Who was Yeah, that? I will. Yeah, actually, it was, uh, it was a man who was our student minister at one point and later on left our church to pastor a church. His name was Don Betts. And Don actually went to pastor a church. And then when he left that church, I actually followed him two pastors later. And so I followed in his footsteps. My uh, a, a lot in those years. And even after he left, he still stayed in touch with me and still opened up doors to let me let me preach and just just help me in that process. And it wasn't it wasn't even a formal sense because he wasn't in our city uh, anymore. He was, but it, but uh, far enough away that I wasn't talking with him every day. We weren't meeting once a week. Uh, he just he just kept in touch with me and let me know what was happening and challenging me to be to be obedient to God in my life. I love it, man. I absolutely love that that is your story. You know, right now, Exponential is doing this really cool thing called a Hero Maker in 2018. That's their next theme. And it's all about this mm. as a leader, that if you're just running a Sunday show or trying to build some institution, you're doing it wrong. And discipleship. And- you know, I had to sit down today and make a little video that was basically recounting who had poured into me. And I probably have the opposite story. I had a nonstop. The only reason I think I made it to a pastor at 20, right or wrong, like you said, a tons of mistakes, but probably was because people were pouring into me nonstop. And sure. that's something, even to this day, like I will seek out mentorship. I will still to this day 
seek out discipleship at all times. So um, walk me through a little bit what it looked like for him. Um, what did he do with you? Because I, I can give you like what I, but you, you know, you're Dr. Chuck Lawless. We want to hear, you know, what does that look, what does discipleship look like for you? First off, what, what did it look like when he did it for you? What does it look like for you now? Well, and again, go back to to what I said a little bit ago. It really wasn't formal with him. Mm. He he just loved me and challenged me and pushed me to be obedient to my sense of calling. Mm. Uh, he he checked up to make sure I was reading the word. He did some of that when he was our was our student minister as well. He he, for example, invited me to walk alongside him doing a bus ministry in the seventies. I mean, I'm seriously dating myself there. But he he challenged me as a as a as a sixteen year old secret child. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's true. That's true. But he challenged me when I was sixteen years old to all right do whatever you can do for for uh, God's glory. And then when he went on to the pastorate and still kept his his arm around me and invited me to come and preach at his church uh, to evaluate my my preaching, he simply he loved me in a way that I welcomed his critique. I think mm. I think that was the that was the big thing. Even though, again, we we were geographically distant a little bit, uh, I still trusted him to to speak to me and challenge me. Today, uh, frankly, I I try to be a little more strategic with my with my own guys, but I also approach it. I argue that we need to approach this missiologically in the sense that every person I invest in is a different guy. Uh, they come from different stories, different backgrounds, uh, different academic backgrounds. Where they are in their spiritual walk, they're not all at the same place. And so if I if I choose to disciple every one of them exactly the same way, then I make them a project, not not my brother in Christ. And so I'll typically back up and say to my guys, let's talk about where you are. Let's talk about what you would what you would want to do, and then let's fill in the gaps, and let's figure out how I work directly with you uh, as a somebody else. So sometimes that means we're we're studying through the scriptures together. Sometimes it means we're we're doing our own study, but we're holding each other accountable to that. Sometimes it means we're we're reading a book together. Sometimes it's just life on life. We're going to we're going to make a trip together, and I'm gonna I'm gonna grill you with every question that comes to mind for for three days. Uh, mm. And so it, it differs per person, but I, but I want them to walk away wanting to be more like Christ, and I I pray that that I model that in the process. That's really good. So, you know what what typically would you use to unpack what they need? So, if uh, I'm just thinking of my church planners here, is they're going, hey, I, I realize if I'm not making you know margin in the ministry for discipleship, then something's wrong, right? Called to make disciples. Right. Um, so, so, you know, running a church service, building an org, like we said, that's, that's not the call. Um, so if the call is discipleship amongst a few other things as well, um, baptizing, you know, this and that, that, that implies the evangelism, proclaiming the gospel, the kingdom, all those things are in there. So, you know, uh, probably you're, you're sensitive to this as well, that, um, right now, as we said, some people are just saying it's only discipleship. No, discipleship is a chief part of it. It's not only discipleship. Mm -hmm. But if, like you said, it doesn't involve evangelism, it's not biblical discipleship. Um, right. So uh, it, unpack for me what questions you would ask somebody. So if one of our church planners is go see someone, hey, I think I'd like to disciple this person. A, how do you choose who it's going to be? And B, what questions do you ask to unpack what they need? Yeah, let me let me back just one second to the issue of discipleship and evangelism and so forth. If I do think it's really important that uh, we continue to make that point that you you've made so well. I, I fear for some guys, if all they're doing is discipleship, they're they're planting classrooms. They're not yes. they're not planting churches. They're planting their seminary classroom. Uh, because that's what they're most comfortable with, and often it's because they've never been discipled. But but it's really not all that the church is called to be. So so here's here's my general approach. I think Jesus shows us something when Luke six tells us he prays all night long before he calls out the twelve. Mm. Now it's not it's not the first time he called them out. It's at least the third time that we see a sense of 
Uh, they are directed to him by John the Baptist. And later he calls them from the sea. And then this third time, he specifically narrows that down to the 12 and then the three. And I think ultimately to Simon Peter. But but there's something about praying deeply as we call out people, because as I look at what happened for Jesus, the father directed him to 12 men, one of whom would stab him in the back and all that would run when he was when he was arrested. And so I, th- I think we need to remember that when we pray, God might direct us to invest in somebody who surprises us. Um, when we don't pray, I think what we're going to do is choose people who are most like us and that we most like. Mm. And and God's wise enough to direct us to people that we most like and are most like us. So I don't think that's that's wrong. But I think if we only choose on those grounds, we might miss somebody that God has his hand on and nobody knows about God. Yeah. Uh, and so so I think praying and watching, watching for people who just naturally gravitate toward us people that hang around us perhaps even in the shadows who who just want to glean something but they're but they're too shy to walk up and ask a question uh, who are who are those folks who already naturally are watching our lives because mm. somebody somebody is right um and then then when i begin those conversations my general approach is to say say to a potential mentee is i want you to write for me if the sky were the limit what would you want out of this relationship and I and I let them at least put it on the table. It's not where we land all the time, but but the reason I want them to put it on the table is I want to know what their dream is. Because if I can't give them that, and I seldom can give them everything that they want, I at least want us to be talking about that up front. I don't yeah. want I don't want my mentee thinking this is what I'm gonna get, and I'm thinking this is what I can give, and I've set them up for disappointment. Right. I'd rather you tell me what you want. And then let's negotiate. I'll talk about what I can give you, but let's also talk about things that you probably need that aren't on your list. If, so if, from a biblical ahead. standpoint, I can like this is popping for me because you see Jesus when he's calling. I mean, John goes into he's the only gospel writer who really goes into a bit of detail about the calling of, of these various disciples. And there's that one scene where John and is it Andrew? You know, they kind of follow him along. And, you know, Jesus turns around and says, what do you want? <laughs> what are you mm-hmm. seeking? Mm-hmm. And that's his first question. So this is really connecting with me because they don't know. They actually yeah, don't right. know what they're seeking. And and until Jesus, and in fact, their their answers kind of faffing about a bit, to quote the British, they, they say, well, uh, where are you staying, Lord? You know, and it's kind of almost like a a filler, like, we don't really know what yep. to answer. Where, where are you saying? And really what they're saying is, we just want to hang out with you a little bit more. But they hadn't That's defined right. what they really wanted. And I love that you bring that out. Yeah, And, and to your point, they, they likely didn't know other than, and I, I think probably there was some confusion about what kind of Messiah he was going to be. But but they certainly just wanted to be with him. So he says, come, come, let's hang out. And Sometimes you can learn an awful lot about a person just by hanging out together. So I would I'd say to your church planters the same thing I say to all of my all of my students. We need to get in the practice of not doing ministry alone. That every opportunity we have to have somebody with us, we're always letting somebody hang around us. Uh, whether it's in a formal relationship, an informal relationship, but we're always teaching somebody because there's always somebody who would love to be taught. Sorry, I had to wait for my train to go by. <laughs> okay. <laughs> for our listeners, I had to put it on mute because uh, so sorry about that awkward pause. But I I live right on a train track. You won't know that, but you'll know it by the end of this second episode. We do. Yes. So, what is what are some of the questions, the clarifying questions that you're going to ask the people that you're going to disciple? I I tell my guys if I'm going to work with you, I I want permission to ask you any question I want to ask you about your life. Mm. Period. If they say to me no, I don't want you to dig into some areas. Then I'm not I'm not willing to make that commitment. It's um, so funny you say this because I wrote a blog about a year ago called "You Need Permission to Mentor Somebody," mm-hmm. and and I got a lot of kickback from me. Oh no, it's a biblical result. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. If you're really going to mentor someone, like you need that permission. There is a a certain 
vulnerability and account. Yeah, you can't just force that on somebody. That's that's right. And in fact, I think it doesn't. I've seen churches that have tried to force mentoring relationships, an older member with a newer member. And and honestly, I have seldom see it work. Right. Uh, it, it, it happens organically as we get on our faces before God and, and seek his direction. Otherwise, it, it typically doesn't work. But I'll, I do want to ask, I want to ask, tell me about your Tell me about the way you read the Bible. Tell me about how you pray. Tell me about the way you love your spouse. If I were to bring your wife in and ask her the same question, what what would she say? Ooh. Tell me tell me the last time that you shared the gospel with with somebody. And it's just my my practice is I want to ask a lot of questions. There's so many things you can learn about people without putting them on the spot when you really are putting them on the spot. Right. Pe- people just receive questions differently than they receive commands. Right. Uh, so you go in as a learner, like you're going into an unreached people group. You go in, I want to learn about you. I want to learn your worldview, your history, your understanding, your theology. And then out of that, let's figure out the best approach to take to, to help you grow. Right. I love that. Absolutely love that. So, um, let me ask you, in discipleship today, um, where do you see it going wrong? Where do you see it going right? What are the things that are encouraging? What are the things that you're concerned about? Encouragement is, I do think we have a young generation of church leaders who recognize that we, we really can't be the church fully if we're not being discipled and, and making disciples. I I think... I think we're seeing a young generation that longs to have older people like like me uh, in their in their churches. They recognize the value of of multi generational congregations, and so they're looking for that. They're welcoming that. Uh, unlike my generation that just stepped out, and I like the fact that we just stepped out, but we didn't realize what we were missing because we had never we had never seen it. And so I, I think there's a real positive in that. There's there's a a real interest in Making sure we get our theology right, I think that's that's good. Uh, on the flip side of that, some of some of the concerns I see. One, as I said, I, I fear that we're going to do discipleship to the neglect or the exclusion of evangelism, right. and think that's sufficient. Right. I do fear that some of our discipleship is entirely head centered. Uh, that mm. I keep giving you data and knowledge, and we're going to read books together, but that doesn't mean we're going to go out and walk the streets and and talk to people about Jesus. Now you're on my favorite t- subject. My absolute favorite subject is how we disciple people hands-on and on the street. So th- mm. this is... This is my sweet spot. This is this is what you and I could talk all day about this, right? And then we'd have to go do something, right? Because we get, we get impatient <laughs> That's right. with ourselves. That's exactly right. What does that look like? How do you ensure that it's not? What have you found as far as ways to keep it from being head-centric? Get outside of an office. Yeah. When, Amen. when you're doing it. Yeah. That's that's the big thing for me. I travel a lot and as often as I can take one of my guys with me, I'm going to do that because I can teach them a lot more about being godly when somebody cuts me off in traffic than I can sitting in my office at Southeastern Seminary. Right. Uh, I can teach them something about prayer if they see me praying not when there's food in front of our face. Uh as as they as they see me teaching and talking to people uh, after uh, after I've taught, the the more you can get outside of some formal setting and really spend time together, which is what Jesus did with with his disciples, it's what Paul did with Timothy. Uh, I think you naturally are going to be talking about those kinds of things because you're not sitting with a book in front of your face the whole time. Right, right. No, that's that's absolutely fantastic. Um, you know what I've come to over the years is that Jesus, he did time teaching and what I call tactics. So tactical training. So it was time, which was life on life. There's teaching, pretty self-explanatory. Um, and then there was, hey, let's get out here and do it. And sometimes he was like, you do this, you feed the people or, you know, you cast this demon out. And we're, we're, we seem to be really good at the teaching stuff. And I think the church is kind of awakening to the life on life stuff. But it's that tactical part that that mm-hmm. going on mission together. And I don't mean like just 
to Tijuana. I mean, right. like literally engaging in, you know, missional engagement, whatever trendy term you want to call it, but it's just doing it. So for example, like the, the, when, when I first came to faith, the, the gentleman who led me to faith literally said, Hey, there's a big concert coming up Sunday night. Um, you know, uh, it was 4th of July and he said, let's go down to the beach and invite people to it. Cause there's going to be evangelism going on in this concert. And I don't care if, if people listening are like, Oh, that sucks. That's the stuff I don't want to do. I love what Moody said, where he said, I, I like the way I do it better than the way you don't. That's, that's right. And, and so yes. what happened was this guy just <clears throat> took me out there and threw me in the deep end. I was days old in the Lord. And that <clears throat> did something to me. I wonder, you know, if that's something that when you're discipling, um, you have learned to, for me, it was like your buddy that, that led you to faith where he had no social skills. There was no intentionality in this. It was, Sink or swim, buddy. There's no equipping. Yeah, There's, yeah. Don't be a sissy about this. Um, that's what it looked like for me. What What have you seen that's been really helpful in getting people out on mission and discipleship? Well, and I and I admit that I am in a unique position here because I can I can open doors for one of my guys, for example, to go preach in a in a local church somewhere. Or I've taken over the years, I've taken some of my guys to a prison where I was doing prison ministry and 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 open the the way for them to get inside the walls and then give them opportunity to, to preach. I, I think some of it is saying, all right, I'm going to, I want you to go with me, but I want you to be prepared to do this. So I, I might say to one of my guys, I want you to go with me. I'm going to preach this Sunday, but I've already asked the pastor. He's giving you five minutes to share your testimony in front of the church. So I want you, I want you to be ready to do that. So, so you're letting them take some steps of faith and, and letting them hear you say, I want you to do your best for the glory of God. Uh, and if it's not all that you want it to be, I want you to know I'm right here with you. Yeah, I love you. We'll pick up and move on. And you're not by yourself here. Uh, we've all been there. Uh, and so I'm, I'm with you. Can, can you and imagine, I think, Paul, you, you know, the first time Timothy gets a go, right, out out in the marketplace somewhere, and Paul's just standing by, just smiling, you know, and Timothy's <laughs> fumbling all over his words and you know, Paul's going, out of boy, out of boy. It's all yeah, right. That's right. It's all right. It's okay. You know, it's going to be okay. That's right. <laughs> well, hey, we're out of time, which really sucks because this is, this is a fun conversation, but I got you for another session. So if you guys are listening to this and the next one is going to be on spiritual warfare, but before we go, um, you guys can catch up with, uh, Dr. Chuck Lawless at chucklawless.com. And you can also, um, uh, listen to his answer to this question, which he doesn't know is coming, but, uh, we get this question. We give it to every guest. Um, the, the players change, but the question remains the same. And that is if you and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, author of The Cost of Discipleship, were to get in a physical fist fight, who would win? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, th- I think. I think he dealt with a whole lot more than than I had to deal with. I suspect he could beat me up. Not that he would, however. Not that he would, but I suspect he could. Yeah, part of the underground resistance movement, right? I mean, yeah, he, he rocked a tie and a suit, but you know, he 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 did life together underground, didn't he? So who knows, man? That guy was probably pretty tough. So. All right. Well, hey, guys, it's been uh, Dr. Chuck Lawless on Hardcore. Thanks for joining us today. Dr. Lawless, thanks for being our guest. And Arnold, hey, thank you. sign us out. Remember, if you are called to church planting, go hardcore or go home. You've been listening to Hardcore Church Planting. Hardcore Church Planting has been brought to you by the Church Planner Podcast and the Church Planner Magazine, which is available in the App Store for both Apple and Android devices. If you like this episode, leave us a positive review. If you didn't like this episode, we'll be happy to give you your money back.